welcome to another episode of I Wish I Was Taught That at School. I'm your host, Evelyn Clark, and together with my co-host, Emily Wallace, we bring you an episode every week on the topics of finance, property, and mindset that hopefully you aren't taught in the traditional schooling system. Now, this week we have a finance-specific guest, Karen Batsilis. Thank you so much for coming in today. Thanks for having me, Evelyn. That's all right. And we actually met on Instagram, funnily enough, or we've been following each other on Instagram for a little while. And Emily kind of connected the dots, I suppose, and and said that we should do a podcast episode together. Um, But before we jump into that, I'll introduce yourself and I'll give a little disclaimer out to our listeners today. Joining us is Karen Batsless, financial advisor from Your Life and Money Matters, an authorized credit representative of Avalon FS. Anything Karen talks about in this episode today is of a general nature and not to be used as personal advice. Thank you, Evelyn. The disclaimer is very important, but happy to share some education with everyone. Thank you so much. So I think today we're going to talk a little bit about money management specifically and how people can start to, I suppose, set themselves up, whether they might be in the initial money management phase and they're buying a house or if they're sort of in that next layer of life and they're looking at what to do next. And you've got some fantastic sort of tips and tricks and things that you used to talk specifically to your clients about. Do you want to give us a bit of a background on how that all started for you? Yeah, so as a financial advisor, I found that a lot of people were really excited about investing and that sort of thing. But really, you're not going to get where you want to go unless you start with the really basics and getting the foundations in place. And I saw it time and time again. So the best place to start is with a budget or a spending plan, as I like to call it. And then from there, develop that into a bit of a structure. And once you've got those foundations in place, that's where you can really take off and start to do probably what is the more fun stuff with yeah. money, like property, investing, that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. We can't get to the fun stuff unless you've got the basics down pat. Exactly. Yeah. I think probably one of the biggest misconceptions that I typically come across is that either it's too expensive to see a financial advisor or that it's a requirement or something that's not really necessarily used unless you're struggling with your money. But that's not true, is it? No. So I think financial advisors can add a lot of value. So I do a lot of work with clients around this specific spending plan and cash flow management. And I try and price that accordingly for clients that need that help and a bit of accountability. And the other part of it is really having a plan in place. So it's going to cost you more by making mistakes than paying for advice to get things right from the start. So it's really about long-term planning, understanding all the different parts of your financial world and getting that in place. So as I said, it's going to cost you more in the long run if you don't get the right things in place. Yeah, absolutely. When should someone come and have an initial discussion with you or when is the right time? Is there a right time? (laughs) Well, I work with clients in their 20s, 30s and 40s. So I say the younger, the better. And usually I see people when something's about to change in their life. So for some people, it's like, oh my goodness, I want to save to buy a house. A lot of people come and say, I've just turned 30 and I've got nothing to show for it. Mm. And then a big one is around having children. Either they've just had children or they're planning to have children. So those life events usually spark an interest in getting their financials really sorted. Yeah, absolutely. And then in terms of the actual spending plan itself, what does that look like? Not giving away all of your secrets, of course, but... <laughs> oh, look, I'm happy to give away as much as I can about spending plan and budgeting and getting your cash flow structure right because if I can just help a few people just by listening, then I'm pretty happy about that. So I love that attitude. Yeah, I think it's, as I said, it should be one of those things that's taught in schools and the more that people can learn about it and, and, and start that process, the better. Um, so with a, the reason I call it a spending plan because people hate the word budget, but it's really... Also, more than that, it's about deciding how you are going to spend your money, which is why it's a spending plan. So it's looking at what you have to spend, but then also choosing how you're going to spend and setting that up. So every little uh, part of your life will need a figure directed, whether it be your going out money, your rent or mortgage, assigning those figures, but actually you taking control of it, hence the word spending plan rather than budget. So it's about taking control of your money and that very first step. I suppose it's a bit of a mindset of, I'm allowing myself to spend money and knowing that I can do that as opposed to sort of that um, restrictive mindset that perhaps budgeting or the word budgeting might provide someone. Yeah, that's exactly right. It it is 100% the um, attitude. Yeah, I love it. So when you're allocating sort of those categories, I suppose it is, that varies for every person I would imagine. Yeah, exactly. Everyone's different. Everyone's got different priorities. A good place to start is with 
goals around what is important to people, what do they want to achieve, and then your spending plan will reflect those goals. So obviously you've got to cover off on the basics first, the needs in life, you know, food, shelter, accommodation, and then you build into it as you can afford more what things, what you want to direct toward your goals. Yeah. Um, and that's what makes it different for everybody. Mm. Is there a figure or a percentage or anything that you would sort of allocate towards those goals or is it really based on, I suppose, what that person's bringing in and where their, where their income allows them to? Yeah, I don't really work off a hard and fast percentage. We really start with, yeah, what they can afford to put towards those goals once we've covered the basics. And, you know, ideally I'd love clients to start off with saving 10% as a round figure, build up to 20, build up to 30 and go from there. But if you lock your core spending plan in early, you know that's what you need to spend. So then every time you get a pay rise or a bonus or whatever, a change jobs, whatever it is, you can actually lock that money away for your goals mm. as opposed to just getting it spent. Because if you don't have a clear plan in place, it just gets eaten up yep. and you don't know where it went or how you survived before on less money. So if we steer away from the percentages and really focus on your core spend and then your plus sort of spend, that's a better way to work at it. Yeah, I love it. How often do you see people uh, who perhaps are getting more income and they're starting to get either a pay rise or a promotion or something at work or even receiving their tax return back? And that money just gets blown or just eaten into their spending. The more they earn, the more they spend. <laughs> Absolutely. It's it's a common thing I see all the time. Yep. And that, that's when people come to me, they're like, I, I don't know what's happened. Like, yeah. where is the money going? And then it, it's a bit of a process to get them back on track. But once we do, they're just like, oh, why didn't I do this sooner? Mm. I, and it's like, it's fine. You've had that time. It's just time to move forward now. Yeah. So, but yeah, all the time, that's what we see. It's just one of those things, right, where you say perhaps you – you would never have gotten to this stage where you know you needed the budget or needed the spending plan and to have that sort of structure in place had you not have perhaps been a bit more lenient with your money in the past. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you've got to go through the pro like you've got you to do. have that time. Like yeah. if you're always super strict with your money, then you're gonna have massive blowouts at some point and you're gonna have this weird relationship with money. So if you go through that phase of yeah, spending quite a lot and then something pulls you up to make the change that's fine like we're not going to look back and feel guilt or shame about that we're just going to go this is how we're going to move forward because now we've got other priorities and previously your priorities might have been going out eating out whatever it was spending time with friends traveling whatever it might have been yeah. not not to feel guilty for it but just to go okay I've lived that part of my life now I'm ready to start prioritizing other aspects yeah exactly yeah i think that's awesome it's such a great analogy for anything in life isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. oh that's good can i ask you a bit of a curly question yeah what do you think of the barefoot investor i think that i haven't read the barefoot investor okay. but I, I get it all the time i'm yeah. just going to do this because the barefoot investor yeah. told me to do that i think if people are reading that book and implementing some of the basics from what i understand i think that's a good thing yeah. because he does talk about budgets, does talk about a bit of a cash flow structure, which I'll talk about my sort of ideal one today. If people are taking that information and doing things with it, that's great mm -hmm. and, and I can't fault that. I think he's a bit hard on financial advisors, especially for someone that is an ex-financial advisor. I don't like that part of it. But yeah. the tips he's got for the general public, great. If everyone can learn from that, then that's a good thing. That's right. And even if they're not implementing it down to the T, as long as they're getting something out of it and they are starting on their sort of wealth creation journey or starting on their just general cash flow management, then it's done more, more good than harm. Exactly. And <laughs> yeah. I, I get people saying, oh, I've started doing this or I'm reading it, but I don't know what to do next or it's not working for me because it's much harder to read something and put it into practice than actually like living it. Yeah, so, it's not tailored to you. Yeah, exactly. So I actually do get some clients who are ready to take the next step who have read it and then and we go from there. So that's not a bad thing either. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So what does the ultimate cash flow plan look like for you? Uh, so it's a little bit different for everyone and I tailor it for my clients and people can tailor it for themselves. But really the idea is to sort of turn this, what a lot of people do, just turn it upside down a bit. So a lot of people, they get their, their bank account. Often it's a Commonwealth bank account because they had that at school. They got set up with their Dolomite account. Yep. Um, so they have that. They get their salary paid into that. They might set up a savings account and whatever's left at the end of each pay cycle so week fortnight or month they'll put some into savings or some people think that they're a really good saver they'll put the money into savings first but often will find themselves dipping back into it mm. and that's the structure that I see all over the place people operate basically out of one bank account money in money out sometimes there's a credit card in the mix 
sometimes a savings account, and that's pretty standard. But what I want to do, and it goes back to taking control of your spending and being free to spend your money, is just turn that around a bit. So when you get paid, you get paid into a cash hub or a bills account. And so you get that salary in there. And then because you've done this spending plan or budget, each week you make a transfer into your everyday account. And that account, that money is for groceries, takeaway, petrol, those sort of everyday needs, coffee maybe, if you've put that into your spending plan. And you pay yourself that amount each week. And that amount of money, you can spend every cent of that every week. And that gives you the control. You've chosen to spend money on those things. You don't have to restrict yourself. I'm quite happy if every, every, whenever you pay yourself, say it's on a Friday, if you get to a Thursday and you're at zero, then Friday the money goes in again for the week ahead. So that's sort of the first step is that paying yourself weekly and letting your salary sit in a separate account, which is, we call the cash hub or the bills account. And then the next step is having, if you've allowed for it in your spending plan, having a goals account or several goals accounts and having money go into those accounts each month usually. So it might be you try and get a high interest savings account. High interest is not really what's around at the moment, but it's still a separate way to work towards those goals. So you might have some money going in every month for a holiday, some money going in if you're looking to purchase a car or a home or whatever it is, and it could be all of those things and you have you know separate amounts going into each account to save for those goals. So having those separate accounts is a really good way to track your progress mm. and feel good about your saving and then feel also okay about that spending out of the other account. Um, so you've got those different accounts, so your goals type accounts, you've got your everyday spending account and you've got that cash hub or bills account that basically controls everything. Yeah. And then you might have a discretionary spend account. So this is the one for things like clothes, gifts. You might like a nice dinner you might want to save up for or a big night out, things that don't necessarily happen every week and you want to accumulate a little bit of money for and you want to set that money aside. This is the thing that people normally end up dipping into their savings for, Mm. but this is where the spending plan comes in. You're planning to spend money on those things, getting your hair done. People forget to put money aside for that because they might go every six weeks, every three months, whatever it is, and then it's quite a significant amount of money. So putting a weekly transfer into this discretionary account So again, based on that spending plan you've set up, you transfer money each week. Now this money you can spend every week if you want, but that means in three weeks' time when it's time to get your hair done, if there's no money there, you don't get your hair done. Mm. So the idea is that some of that money will be spent each week, like a little bit, but some of it will pull there for those bigger expenses that occur. And that's really your your fun sort of spending money. Yep. And the idea is that it's always there. So if you want to do something, there's money there, but if for whatever reason there's none there, you don't you do can't it. do that thing yeah. yeah so say you've got an event coming up in a few weeks time and you really want to buy a new dress for it then you know that you've probably got to be a little bit stricter out of that particular account for the next few weeks because yeah. you need money at that stage to make that purchase or get your hair done or like whatever you said yeah yeah like get your nails done, whatever it might be yeah um you need to make sure the money's there to do it rather than going back into the savings or as people often do into the credit card yeah yeah so you've still got control to spend out of, out of that account, but you need to be a bit more strategic with your spending and a bit more thoughtful. And if you follow your spending plan, there'll always be money in there for the things you need. Mm. So what happens with the surplus money, I suppose, that's sitting in that, that cash hub or the um, account where we get our sol- salary deposited into? So there shouldn't really be a surplus in there. So yep. what should be in there is enough for your bills for the month. So not all bills happen monthly. Some might be quarterly or annually. In that case, there should be a little bit of money pooling in there for when those big bills come in. But essentially, that sort of should be a working account for bills and payments and that's it. Yeah, perfect. when you've done your spending plan, you've allocated money already to those goals and that's Mm. where your surplus would be going. Yeah, that makes sense. Fantastic. So if someone had a mortgage with an offset facility, is there a particular one of those accounts that you would allocate to be the offset? I mean, you can technically offset as many um, different, you can have multiple loan splits yeah. to offset anyway, but is there a particular account that someone would nominate to be the primary offset facility? Yeah, so this is where the structures are tailored depending on the client's circumstances. Yeah. So sometimes that cash hub or bills account might be an offset account if they've just got the one offset account or um, if they've got significant savings, it might be the offset might actually be one of those goal accounts. Yeah. So if um, 
The other thing I like to have for clients is what I call a buffer account as one of your goals accounts. So that's your backup money. You want to have a fair bit of chunk of money in there if something goes wrong and that sort of thing. So often that will be the offset yeah. as well. Like the car breaks down and all of a sudden you need to get a, something yeah. like a couple of thousand dollars of There's, unexpected expenses. Yeah. So they're still going to happen and that's why we have that buffer account to plan for those. I like people to have sort of three to six months salary in there. Not always possible from day one, but that's one of the things we'd work towards with clients. And if that's the account that has the highest amount of money in there, usually that's where we'll use the offset account. Yeah. Fantastic. Do you talk much to clients about using credit cards or managing existing credit cards? Yeah, I do. Yeah. As you can see, my structure doesn't have a credit card yeah, in it. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> um, so the preferred core structure is no credit card. Yeah. Uh, the thing about credit cards that I find is even if you pay them off at the end of every month, you just have this thing called credit card credit card creep and you tend to spend a little bit more than you otherwise would spend. Mm which you don't do when you're actually allocating exact amounts of money. So some people are very attached to their credit cards and I can't break them of the habit. And so they will continue. The agreement sort of is just bills and those sort of expenses and it gets paid off each month. So that would be where we'd add it in. Yeah. The other thing I work with clients on is a lot of them do come with a bit of credit card debt Mm. that has got on top of them. It might've been used when they were sort of earning a fair bit less money and, and it sort of did help them out, but now's the time for it to go. So sometimes that is literally cut up the credit card, but we're transferring X amount each month or week to get rid of that debt. And sometimes that forms part of the plan. Yeah, absolutely. It's something that I see quite commonly as well. People come to me and they've got multiple credit cards and it's either because like you said, that they started off as a dollar mite and all of a sudden they've turned 18 and the Commonwealth banks offered them a credit card because they've been a loyal customer Yeah. or, you know, they've just sort of accumulated cards over time and didn't really realize that, not paying or clearing it each month meant that it just sort of eventually creeps up until all of a sudden it becomes a full-on debt that they then need to clear. And making those minimum repayments is never going to clear it off in a quick amount of time. No, and it's going to cost them a lot in interest in the amount of time they do pay it off. So, Yeah. yeah. The people that are really attached to them are like, oh, but I'm getting these points (laughs) and I'm going to get a free flight. And all my reading says that you need to sort of spend an absolute minimum, I think, of $36,000 a year on credit to even sort of break even in terms of points. Yeah, wow. And uh, even more to actually get somewhere. So, yeah, to start accumulating any points. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's where they come in really handy for businesses that have large business expenses. They go on credit cards, they get heaps of points. That sort of works. Mm. But I haven't seen many individuals where it actually works on paper. In their head it works and they might get a free flight here, but I'm like, you spend so much money for that. I know, it's a great marketing tool, isn't it? They really nailed it, but you're right. And I did have um, someone say to me once a little while ago that they had read a fair bit of research around that exact thing and the stats about essentially people who had used credit cards to sort of obtain points or do whatever they thought the rewards would be from it never ever came to fruition in terms of the amount that they spent versus what they made. Yeah. It's all a marketing campaign. Because yeah. even the, the annual fees on the cards that earn you a lot of points are quite hefty. So mm. then you've got to make back that fee as well Yeah, before you're getting anywhere. Yeah, definitely. But the, the banks have done really well with that. <laughs> individuals, not so much. So no credit cards, uh, it's something that we both agree on or yeah. uh, something that we both like to see in our clients. Any other tips? I think the main, not so much a tip, but it's really difficult to set this up. So, you know, you think, yep, I'll get my, got my budget or my spending plan and I've done all this, but why aren't I going anywhere? And so it's not easy. It sounds easy. So I guess my tip here is to stick with it. So the first three months are hard. Yes, you can spend everything in that everyday account, but you you do have to have a bit of a behavioral shift. And that's why I've put the structure in place because it's not easy to change behavior. So this structure helps you have to change the behavior, but um, I'll see people and there will be a few cheeky transfers in those few initial months from the savings to the spending or the discretionary spend. And that's okay. But as long as you keep getting better each month, and I would say after six to 12 months, most of the clients that I work with that do this, they start saying, oh, well, I don't need this much in my weekly spending account. I want to save more of this. Mm. So it's amazing to see the behavioral shift over that amount of time by just sticking with it and keeping the structure in place. So 
that my number one tip, stick with it. And the other one is if what I've outlined doesn't quite work for you, have a think about the framework as a big picture and then tailor it to what does work for you. So there's not one size fits all, but this is a really good guide as a starting point and then tailor it to what's going to work best for you. Yeah, fantastic. I think you made a really good point there about having to stick it out in the first, you know, those initial few months. I think it can be quite overwhelming for people to sit down and look at their financials when perhaps they have previously neglected them or subconsciously put them on the back end because it's overwhelming and it can be daunting to sort of sit down and look at your financial perspective as a whole. Um, So definitely taking that first step. But then like you say, sticking it out, when people start to see those savings accumulate, that's when they'll start to get excited by it and want to save more. Yeah, exactly. And I've seen people, you know, on reasonably what we'd consider low or below average salaries turn around in the year and say, oh my goodness, I've got 2000 in my bank account. I've never had money in a bank account before. And then I've got other people that have been earning, you know, 150000 plus and they're so, they've just been spending everything. So it's taken them a long while to get the shift and they'll have really big savings. But for them, it was like, oh, I really had this huge behavioral shift and I had to go out on a date. And so I just found all the coins I could around the house because I knew you wouldn't let me spend any money <laughs> extra than what I had. So it, it works for everyone in some format and it is just sticking it out until you can see the results. And then once you see them, that's when it gets exciting and you can do different things with your money. So once you've got those goal savings accounts for you, that's when you're ready to take the next step and go, well, maybe I'm ready to have this as a home deposit account or maybe I'm ready to invest a little bit of money because my surplus is now growing. Mm, fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Karen. I think you've been incredibly articulate in how you've sort of explained that spending plan and hopefully everyone can have a bit of think about where they're at and perhaps reach out to you if they need some help or assistance or just want to have a general conversation. What's the best way for people to get in contact with you? Um, so the best way is probably on email. So Karen, K-E-R-Y-N at ylmm.com.au. I'm happy to answer any general questions. So uh, I'm a financial advisor. The fee doesn't start running as soon as we chat. <laughs> I, I'm happy to help people with this structure and answer some general questions where I can. So please get in touch. I'm also on Instagram at your life and money matters. And um, as Evelyn said at the start, that's how we've met yep. <laughs> indirectly. So I'm also ha- quite happy to meet people through there and share some information. And I do share a few tips on there as well. Yeah, fantastic. This is actually the first time we're meeting in person. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Funny how the world works, isn't yeah. it? It's happened to me a few times where I've actually met a potential business partner and people that end up being really fantastic people in business that I work with or that my clients work with. And it's all started through Instagram or LinkedIn or whatever it might be. Yeah, same. I yeah. think it's just amazing. It's so good, isn't it? So we've come to a part in the podcast called You've Been Schooled. I don't know if you've listened to any of our previous episodes, but I'm going to school you on hopefully something that you haven't heard before. Okay. All right. This is a bit of a funny one. Uh, Because we're both females, I thought I'd stick with a female-themed fact. Apparently, (laughs) the average woman eats about two to three kilos of lipstick in her lifetime. Oh, that's <laughs> disgusting. I know it is, isn't it? I suppose if you think about it, being on your lips all that time, I don't really wear lipstick, so I hopefully I'm on the first time in months today. And oh, I'm really? Like, Why am I doing oh, that? no, you're never going to put it on again. I've scarred you. It's probably lip balm and stuff as well. Lip balm, definitely. I yeah. put that on all the time. Yes, yeah, yeah. So. there you go. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today, Karen. Um, as we said, people can reach out to you. We'll put all of your details in the show notes as well. Great. Um, but yeah, just if anyone wants to have a chat or wants to get their spending plan organized, we would highly recommend they come and have a chat to you. Thanks, Evelyn. Thanks for having me. And we'll speak to you all on Wednesday with our Chalk Talks. And Emily will be bringing back another episode next week on property. Thanks for listening, guys.